Great. Well, I guess I will get started. Um, well, welcome everyone. So the Anatomy of a Zero Waste Campaign digital series with four essential strategies for movement leaders is a continuation of the Zero Waste Master Plan, which is something we published last year. Um, it includes a menu of common sense zero, zero waste implementation op options um, that goes through the nuts and bolts of really building a zero waste campaign that is community led. And it also includes a companion guide with organizing tools and much more. So this digital series is a, a continuation of this project that zooms in, <laughs> zooms in. Um, on uh, some four essential organizing strategies. So today's panel on organizing communities will be followed by sessions around working with legislators, telling your story, creating system, systems level organics policy. Um, as you know, the whole package, you can attend um, one or all. Um, we're really excited to be offering this resource to y'all um, and definitely welcome suggestions for other types of webinars and trainings and the like that you would wanna see from us. So a little bit about Gaia real quick for those who aren't familiar. Um, we're a global network of more than 800 grassroots organizations working to catalyze a just transition to zero waste um, and supporting local organizers who are campaigning to build zero waste cities and communities is a really important part of our movement. Um, so an intro to the panelists. Um, our first presentation will be from Shoshanda Campbell. Um, she works for South Community, uh, South Baltimore Community Land Trust, or SBCLT, uh, which is a nonprofit committed to creating community-led development without displacement and a just transition to zero waste in Baltimore. So Shoshanda is both a community leader and activist as a student at Ben Franklin High School in South Baltimore. Uh, Shoshanda founded Free Your Voice, a student-led group that worked for five years to shut down the largest incinerator proposal in the country, which was going to be built less than a mile away from their school. Um, she has since helped develop the South Baltimore Community Land Trust and is a member of Gaia's Failing Incinerator Project cohort. A lifelong Baltimore resident, Shoshanda is committed to the implementation of Baltimore's Fair Development Plan for zero waste, which SBCLT helped spearhead um, to lead her community through a just transition. Um, our second panelists represent um, the Brookhaven Landfill Action and Remediation Group in Long Island, also known as BLARG, their acronym, which is <laughs> great, um, a community-led coalition. Um, they're committed to exposing and rectifying the harms caused by the Brookhaven Landfill. Um, and began an initiative raising awareness of the town's plans to also implement an Asheville site in a place adjacent to the landfill. So we have two folks joining us from Blarg, Gabrielle Houston, um, sorry, I'm, that's so New York of me. Houston um, has a Master of Science in Environmental Policy and Sustainability Management from the New School. She worked with Blarg for her capstone project to research and uncover for Long Island's racist waste management plans and to build opportunities for zero waste. Gabrielle still works with Blarg and is helping Gaia develop toolkits that support grassroots and environmental justice groups. Um, we're also joined by Erin Zipman, who is also working with Blarg. She is a sophomore at Binghamton University, majoring in environmental public policy, who's been working and uh, learning in environmental justice in the environmental justice sphere for a couple of years now. She's involved with several environmental and social justice groups. Um, so yeah, it's really exciting to have um, such a range of voices and cities um, on this panel. Um, we are super excited to share, um, to share this stuff with you and there'll be time for, uh, some Q and A after each panelist presentations. Um, but we should also have a couple of minutes, um, of questions at the very end that you can ask both panelists. So keep those questions in mind. Um, you can use the Q and A box, but it's also fine if you put it in the chat. Cool. Um, Shashanda, are you ready? Yeah, I can. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, 
Can you guys see that? Yep. All right. So hi, everyone. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this. Um, I am with the South Baltimore Community Land Trust. I got involved in this type of work when I was in high school, as you heard, helping to find a group called Free Your Voice. Um, and it was a student-led group out of Benjamin Franklin, which is in the South Baltimore communities of Baltimore. Um, and it's just really, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of issues in our communities, especially when it came to health, asthma, upper respiratory issues. We've seen this in our school. We just didn't know, like, when we were younger, what, what was this linked to? Um, we have a lot of polluting industries, which I'll talk about um, throughout this presentation um, that really, you know, played a role in why we had these type of um, issues. So this here is a map. And as you can see um, down there where all those, um, all those numbers are, that's concentrated in one area, that there is the South, is South Baltimore. And that is a open air coal pile. It is a landfill. It is a medical waste incinerator. It is the Bresco incinerator, which is a trash burning incinerator. Um, and then there is multiple chemical companies um, that's also there. And then there was also that proposed incinerator that we fought off. Um, and so, as you can see, it's a lot of cluster of stuff that's literally in the in this community, and it's a community of color and low income. Um, and we've seen it. We've seen the impacts of it every day. We've seen it in the kids that went to my school. We still see it in the kids that go to like the school I graduated from. Um, and you know, when we did form for your voice, it was a way to take back the community's voice to say like we have a right to say no to these um, institutions, these um, industries coming to our communities and polluting it. Like we can say no. So that was the you know we really stood up and it was the first time that we actually won. And so you know it was a big thing and people started to feel like oh my god like we can win we can get these things out of our community because a lot of people that lived there for a long time when we first started they said there is no way this stuff is going to go like it's always been this way and it's not going to change and then like that did change and so it was a lot of momentum that was grown through that um fight with that first incinerator that led to like continuing to the incinerator that we do have already built. And so this here is the Bresco incinerator. As you can see, it costs $55 million a year in health damages to residents. And that was a statistic that was founded by um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation here. And it was just trying to put a number to the amount of pollution. And that's only one particle. It's not literally all of the particles that's being released from that incinerator. And so it was really the first time that we had a number that we can literally go to community and say, this is the number. This is what it means. And, the, you know, when talking with residents, they felt that number because it was in their daily lives that they was dealing with hospitalizations for asthma, upper respiratory issues, and seeing it in their kids. Um, and so we was very reactive a lot to these systems that was around us. And we wanted to ask the community, Come together since we were already in space talking about these bad things we want to say what do we want to see in our community what is it that we want our community to look like um how could we like you know funnel this waste to be like a benefit in our community rather than polluting the community and so we really started to like really want zero waste solutions here in baltimore and so it was getting the zero we don't have the infrastructure right now only thing we have is an incinerator in the landfill and so when those are the only two options you have everything look like it belongs there and so we created this movement right now um, to like start to build that infrastructure that we need to address our waste. Um, and so we're starting with the first phase of getting a compost facility. 40% um, of the waste stream here is food waste. And so that's what's being burned, it's being buried um, and it's increasing um, the climate change and it's also like polluting communities, which, you know, it doesn't have to. And so when talking with the communities and residents, one thing that we agreed on is that we don't want to make any other community a dumping ground, right? We want to like say no community can be a dumping ground. And that's what the zero waste challenge is for us in zero waste period. It's like not creating dumping ground communities, but creating solutions that are sustainable in communities um, without um, putting their lives in jeopardy. And so we did all of this work um, around this. And then even with communities, we came together and we said, how do we get something in place that literally has all of this roadmap out of how we wanna move our communities from burning and burying to a just transition to zero waste. And so what you saw in the beginning, this here is uh, the zero waste plan, the fair development plan for zero waste. Um, it was adopted by city council um, and it was created literally in communities. And so we hired um, Gary List, who was like, the expert of making these zero waste plans, he's done the most. Um, and we literally had him go out to all these community groups, community residents, individuals, creating spaces for them to say what guiding principles they wanted this plan to be guided by. Um, and then like also 
what what does that look like when we put those guiding principles into actual implementation of something um, around these zero waste solutions? And so that's how that plan was formed. It was formed in communities with residents that knew, you know, like that had a voice. We were giving people a voice that doesn't usually have a voice at the table. Um, and so even though all of this stuff we did, that plan was adopted, uh, we stopped an incinerator, we literally put numbers to like the amount of pollution and how it is impacting the health of residents. Um, the county and the city contract with that Bresco incinerator was still resigned. Um, and it was resigned for another 10 years. Um, it wasn't by our current mayor now, it was by uh, a, mayor, a mayor that was outgoing. Um, and so our contract here for the city is 10 years, but for the county, it's five to six years. And the difference between the contract is we do not have a put or pay. So we can send a certain amount of waste, um, but we don't have to send literally a certain amount of tonnage that they want us to. Um, but the county, they have to send a certain amount of tonnage. So that's the difference between the contracts. And sadly, they were signed. It was a big loss for communities. They were signed on election day where people were voting. Um, and we quickly started to do an action around it to literally stop the vote, but it still took place and the contract was signed. Um, and so we really started to go into this tactic to talking with residents and communities like, okay, guys, this is not a loss. We can't see the, like it is a loss, but we can't see this as the end. We have to figure out how we can keep going. And so we started to really starving the beast, which is the incinerator. Um, and that first phase of getting the food waste out of the waste stream. Um, and since it makes up to 40% uh, percent of the waste stream, you know, it'll be a lot that we'll be taking out. And we'll also be creating that uh, local infrastructure here in Baltimore, a compost facility for like anchor institutions and residents to be able to send their, uh, compo their uh, food scraps to. Um, and there was a Maryland law that came out that now that's going to be in effect in 2023. Um, and it's basically if you produce a certain amount of tonnage, you can no longer send it to a landfill or an incinerator. It has to go to a compost facility or an AD facility, um, anaerobic digestion. Um, and so what we started to do was we did a lot of these. We had pres a presentation that was going around. Communities were talking about it, um, but we didn't really sit down and create this presentation until we came together. We were like, okay, now that, how do we talk about this thing? What do we want to say? What is our ask to people throughout the city to get them on board with this thing and rally the, them around this? Because, you know, it's never enough outreach. Like, and I think that's what we learned. We, we had a good base, but it wasn't everybody. And it's never enough until they touch every resident here in the city. Um, and they get a say in these systems that we wanna see. Um, and so we're always trying to build the base and get more people involved in this movement and get their uh, opinions of what this movement means to them. Um, and so we started this trainer trainer session, which was we took people that cared about this issue um, and we put us all in a room. Um, some people knew from the start to finish, they've been in this for 10 years. Some barely knew anything. They were just coming in and say, hey, I want to help because this is an important issue. Um, and so we had five sessions that people went through to literally be able to give this presentation of like the start of this movement, the current in this movement, and what the visions for the future are from the communities. Um, and it was really good in the fact that it got more people out there to talk about this thing and it made them feel comfortable talking about it um, more. Um, and so the first session was just introductory, figure out who was in the room. Um, it was getting goals and outcome that we wanted from this outreach. Um, we were we are having monthly meetings. So it was like this big zero waste meeting that we were having uh, where all of the communities, different groups that's here in Baltimore that's working on this issue would come together um, and we were hosted and residents would talk about, okay, what are our next step? Who is the outreach? Who's gonna do actions? What, what are we doing? Um, and so we wanted to get more people involved in that. So we started doing uh, those presentations to associations um, that were around the communities um, and also just like organizations and student groups that wanted to be more involved with this movement. Um, and then we trained them on this presentation that was created in that zero waste meeting. Um, I can show you just a little bit. Um, it just talks a lot about like this movement around um, the incinerator, how we want to move from extraction to really move into zero waste, which is more respectable to our lives. Um, and we wanted to encourage them to make this their presentation. So it's like, yeah, we we did create this presentation with main points around like sign-ons, what we leave at, like what we leave with these organizations, like fact sheets. But we really wanted to make this presentation more like people, like they can talk about it in their own way. Um, so we did um, the 
presentation first and we were like hey does it sound right what's missing ask questions and you know like encouraging them to take notes on those slides and then they did the presentation themselves so we broke them up into pairs and then they were able to try these presentations on their own to see like okay am i getting the main points or am i connecting with people in the way that i think i am um and then we came back to the bigger groups to just say, OK, what's working well with these, this PowerPoint? What's still challenging? How can we make it better um, to just like, um, you know, we're always trying to make it better. It's a forever changing PowerPoint because there's always something new happening in these movements. Um, and then the fifth session was really um, the fourth section was creating the materials. So we had some materials already that we were already using, but we wanted to create more like the sign on sheet we created. And then we created a, a sign on that was the gap pool out of the wish screen, which we distributed to the groups that we were meeting with um, that wanted to like sign on to talk about why it is important, um, calling on the mayor and anchor institutions to literally stop burning and burying their food waste. Um, and so the, we had a lot of just like, sheets that we use like sign-in sheets, which is here. So that's available for anyone if you wanna use it. Um, and then we also, to make sure everyone were good and we felt comfortable, we did a popcorn of the like slides. So I might've did the first one, someone did the second one. And then we just did that in front of the larger group to make sure everyone was good. And then we got out there. So the fifth section was we went and we made our example emails, um, we started making calls, we started connecting with groups on the ground to say, hey, can we give you this presentation um, to talk more about this issue. A lot of groups knew about it, but they weren't like directly involved. So they heard about it through some other birdie and they were like, oh, I heard about it. I just didn't know how I can get more involved or like um, how it relates to some of the stuff we're doing, um, how we can link them to make it uh, more effective. And we really wanted to, oh, this is an example email for one of our youth leaders um, that's available too. It's just talking about like that, the presentation that we wanted to give people. We had a 30 minute presentation, but it can be cut into like a pitch um, for organizations and associations that couldn't, you know, they didn't have 30 minutes to spare with us right away. Um, and it was really also, we did all of these things to get the commitment from the people that wanted to be involved in this movement more. We wanted them to come to the zero waste meeting to like say what, what, what they wanted from this movement also and how it deeply affect them to be able to tell their stories. Um, and we wanted to get the mayor to commit to like, why it is important to start with getting food out of the waste stream and just like literally not relying on the incinerator period. Um, and so that's a video that the mayor did create, um, mayor, uh, Scott here, he created this video that talks a lot about food waste um, contributing to um, climate change and like uh, pollution and why we shouldn't be doing it. We need to move away from that as a city. Um, and then we also got anchor institutions like universities and school systems to literally be able to say like, oh, I am doing this thing. All of my waste are going to this incinerator and it's polluting communities of color and low income and we shouldn't be doing that. And so we organized students on campuses to be able to give this presentation also um, and talk with other students and then also talk with their universities about getting them to like um, help us um, have leverage to be able to get this compost facility here working with the city. Um, and so that's, I think, where I'll stop. Um, and it was just like a lot of, I think, just meetings to be able to like make sure everyone had a, like an option to literally like voice their opinions and feel comfortable. Um, and that, you know, this was a move, it's a people's movement. And so it has to involve people. Um, so we're always trying to get more people and tell them about this thing that's happening, that's affecting them, putting a name to the issues that they're experiencing that they just probably don't know about. Yeah, so I'll end there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shashanda. Um, this was super informative and the examples you provided are, I think, super helpful. And um, I, oh, we had a question. Are you comfortable with um, us sending out the slides that you shared in a follow-up email? Oh yes, definitely. Anything on there you can take. And I, cool. and the popcorn slide, I've seen that question. Popcorn slide is when like there's a presentation, a presentation is like, 15 slides maybe um and it's like i do one slide i call on someone else they do the next slide and then we keep doing that until the presentation is over um and everyone usually get a chance to participate in that way cool thank you for that uh explanation um so we have a question from bianca lopez uh who's 
with Valley Improvement Project. So she says the incinerator in California, Central Valley says that they pollute less than the allowable amount. Did the incinerator in your area say the same or does it just pollute to its max allowable amounts or maybe exceed it? Um, and also just as an add on to that, like how did you guys find that information? Because navigating through all of these like agency documents and the company practices is kind of a daunting process. So some input on that would be cool too. Yeah, I think that um, to answer your first question, to be honest, the incinerator doesn't like they don't care. And it's just because they're not actually being regulated in a real way. Um, if they are coming out to check their pollution levels, they tell them. So it's like then they can prepare themselves to do that. But other than that, they don't. We did in that new contract have an um, emissions agreement. Um, and it was the certain amount that they could pollute of like NOx, for example, right? And then it's like, okay, once you get to this level of pollution of NOx, then now um, you have to pay. You have to pay this amount, but then you can still do it, but you just pay for it, um, which really sucks because it's like you're saying like profit over people again. Um, and for those documents, I don't do exactly everything, right? I We have a team of people. Um, I think that's when you call onto your network because like, there's people that that's like lawyers, they know how to get those access to people and get those uh, those forms. I personally do not. I'm just going to be I call on those people um, and we do bug them sometimes just like, uh, can you give us this? Can you give us this? And we try to go to like the mayor or like city council people that we're working with to see if they can get access to it first. Um, and then we, we reach out to like other residents that know how to do it. Cool. Thanks, Shashanda. Um, and uh, another question, um, it's a little bit long, so I'm going to abbreviate it a bit just for the sake of time. It's from Patricia Taylor. She's asking, um, how can we get corporations and the government to recognize the unhealthiness and non-sustainability of ignoring the real costs um, of pollution of these facilities and you know, the burdens of business as usual for folks, because we understand the connections between these, facility, these facilities and health, but the regulatory system um, is not as, um, is not good about that. So yeah, how, how are you guys um, organizing to influence the views of corporations and your local government, especially? Yeah, I think that it's first exposing it and calling it out for what it is. Like we called it a racist and equitable system um, that was in place and it stays in place and it oppresses communities of color and low income. And no one really wants to hear that. Like they're not, they're like, oh, are you calling me racist? Are you saying this about me? We're like we're calling you what the system is. It's a racist system. Um, and I think that also it's um, what we do is we, people's stories are powerful. People have stories in their community linking to these type of like, like pollution. So they're like, I didn't have these problems until I moved in this community. And then now all of a sudden I got asthma, or I got cancer or like me and people on my block, all of us got cancer. That doesn't make sense. We didn't have it prior. Um, and so it's definitely organizing around storytelling and telling their narratives. And then also it's to literally disrupt the system. It's, trying, it's disrupting that uh, business as usual mindset because it's disrupting people's lives all the time. Like it's literally causing health damages to people and they have to learn to live with it. So I think definitely um, disrupting that and putting a face to what's happening. So it, like, if, it, if you want to call out those big corporations that you see, like doing those like waste audits, I know like some, like one of the universities that I work with here today are actually tells them they're doing a waste audit today. And they're trying to put a name to like what's in their bins and like what can't be recycled, what can't be composted. And why are, why are, why are we not making those companies if they want to keep selling stuff, we make them figure out the problem of like, how do you make something sellable that doesn't end up with the end game of disposal of incineration or landfilling. That's their problem. If they want to make a profit, then they, they have to respect the lives of people um, and making it more convenient, I think. That's so true. Um, and we have one time for one last question. I think an interesting one from Yayoi Koizumi. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. My, um, he, they say that they have some issues with people in their group who do a lot of talking online or in other spaces. Um, it, but very little in terms of work. Um, there are a lot of criticisms. So they're wondering what they can do to create a nurturing and supportive culture that has the type of participation that you folks have achieved. You I have think about two minutes. Yeah, I think it's just challenging people first. So like, it's okay. Like you don't have to like, 
I think in this movement, it is a people's movement and we tend to be like, like supportive and like very caring and like we empathize with them around like what they're feeling. But I think also just challenging people and then making those meetings with the in sessions of whatever that is to do something in the meeting. And I think that that gets them to like every, every end of your meeting, whatever that may be, you have to do this. You have to either send out this sign on, you have to like, uh, you have to do like some presentation as the end game of these sessions, blah, 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 but making some type of acts of people there in a session um, and making them feel valued and like supported in that. Awesome. Thank you, Shashanda. Um, and I, again, thank you for that question. I think that's a really important one that a lot of organizers are facing. Um, cool. So now we'll be moving on to um, the folks from Blarg, um, if you could pull up your presentation and share your screen, that would be great. Thank you so much, Shashanda. Um, and we'll have some time for more questions directed at both Shashanda and Gabrielle and Erin um, at the end of uh, the webinar. And like Shashanda mentioned, we'll be sending out a link to those uh, slides and other materials referenced in this session. Um, and just as a reminder, this is part of the series. So real quick, I'm just gonna drop the registration link for the full um, event series in the chat. Um, and yeah, take it away, Gabrielle and Erin. Thank you so much, Adi, and thank you so much, Shashanda, for your great presentation. So hi, everyone, my name is Gabrielle Houston. Um, I'm representing Blarg today. So the Brookhaven Action and Brookhaven Landfill Action and Remediation Group emerged from a Black Lives Matter protest um, that were occurring throughout Long Island and the rest of the United States in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd in the summer of 2020. And group activists from all over the town of Brookhaven identified the Brookhaven Landfill as an issue of systemic racism and a blight on the health of the future of the local community. Folks from Blarg were initially seeking to have more community involvement in the promised 2024 closure of the landfill. This group, however, soon discovered that the town did not have a plan to close the landfill, but rather to expand it. Blarg's Close Means Close campaign has grown into a regional movement advocating for the closure and remediation of the Brookhaven landfill and calls for regional accountability and partnership in supporting a just transition away from incineration, landfilling, and towards a zero waste um, infrastructure that does not perpetuate environmental racism and threaten our national environment. So just a brief history of the Brookhaven landfill. So efforts to resist and get the landfill closed began right from its construction. And it was constructed in 1974. And throughout its 50 years, it's been surrounded in controversy and has raised alarms with local residents and advocates. Um, as soon as the landfill was built, odor complaints began pouring in. And in 1984, it was confirmed that the liner to the landfill had ripped and that leachate was now, or leachate plume was now heading southeast. This is incredibly dangerous as Long Island lies on an aquifer and groundwater for its millions of residents. So Long Island actually has a land, landfill law from the NYDC, which restricts landfilling on Long Island for this very reason. Um, aftermath of this is that Covanta Energy or Waste Energy Treatment Plants set up four facilities in the town of Hempstead and also set up facilities in the town of Islip, the town of Babylon, and the town of Huntington. In 1990, the Brookhaven landfill no longer accepted municipal solid waste but still accepted ash from Covanta facilities and construction demolition debris. And in the aftermath of this, the landfill is still in operation and there have been plans and, uh, and um, expansion proposals for the landfill since. So a brief um, rundown of what's going on at the landfill. Annually, it receives around 350 tons of ash and 700 tons, 700,000 tons of commercial construction and demolition debris. So the waste residue from the town of Brookhaven, town of Hempstead, the town of Huntington, the town of Smithtown, and the town of Islip, which is about 2 million people on Long Island, 
eventually has its ash residue landfilled in the Brookhaven landfill. And this continues because currently the landfill generates approximately $66 million in gross revenue and 30 to $35 million in net revenue for the town of Brookhaven. And again, the ash received at the landfill comes from Kavanta Huntington, Kavanta MacArthur, and Kavanta Hemset. I'm gonna pass this off to Erin. So yeah, hello, I'm Erin. Um, and so uh, like, like Gabrielle had said, uh, BLARG, the Brookhaven Landfill Action Remediation Group, was born out of the Black Lives Matter movement. And we, we do want to highlight the fact that this is not just a trash issue, it is an environmental justice issue. Um, so you can see in these maps that we have on the screen um, that the on the left we have uh, the red dot where Covanta, the Covanta incinerator is located. And then on the right we have where the landfill is located. Both of those are right next to uh, what you see in purple is potential environmental justice areas. Um, where we have a higher concentration of low-income communities and communities of color. And the next slide. Uh, and so we can see the effects of these very clearly in comparison to the rest of Long Island. Uh, we have the lowest life expectancy on Long Island in and around the area next to the landfill. Uh, and this is according to centers, the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, a CDC um, data that we have the lowest life expectancy here. So it's like extremely correlated um, with, with the health of the residents who live right next to the landfill and around the landfill. And the next slide. Um, so then here we also can see again uh, that the communities right next to the landfill are the most diverse, ethnically, racially uh, co diverse communities um, on Long Island. We also have um, we uh, we also have the, the these lands that are from we have uh, Uncatug lands and um, Shinnecock Native Americans who live in these areas, uh, who still live in these areas and are feeling the effects of the landfill most closely. And it's, it's very clear that there's a reason why the landfill is located in this area. And, um, and that race plays very much, race and racism plays very much into where the landfill has been cited and why we've had so much trouble um, trying to deal with the effects of the landfill. And then just another, another set of data points that we have, um, that North Bellport, which is where the landfill is located, consistently ranks in the 80th to 95th percentile nationally uh, for almost all of the Environmental Protection Agency's environmental justice indicators. So basically that means we have some of the worst, um, the worst levels of fine particulate matter, ozone, diesel particulate matter, uh, cancer risk, uh, air toxic, air respiratory hazards, um, lead paint in housing, proximity to Superfund sites, proximity to transfer storage and disposal facilities, um, which is like all of these proposals that are coming in and playing into our waste crisis. So uh, from that, all that data, we can see that uh, we have a very diverse community and that we have an extreme waste crisis, but that also cannot detract from the fact that people are still living there. Like they're also living through, it's not just data points, people are living through this. Um, and so the, the black indigenous and people of color in this community and the rest of the community as well, do not deserve to have to deal with this landfill anymore or any other waste infrastructure that is not moving us towards zero waste. Um, and so, we want closed means closed. We want the landfill to be closed. It's just point blank. That's what we, what's what we need. Um, and we are demanding that the town acknowledge that this has been a burden on the community for 50 years and that they honor their promises to close the landfill. They have not really given us any sort of reassurance that that will happen when it's supposed to. Um, 
that they will reject the expansion plan for the landfill and like the Asheville for the collection of the ash um, and pursue a plan that is really driven in the fact that we need to get down to zero waste and we need to remediate the area that the landfill has polluted and we need reparations for the community that has dealt with this for so long. So then what does BLARG do? Um, so BLARG has engaged in many protests, uh, like direct action. We've also been very active on social media. We've had digital bird doggings, which is basically like some of our members will go harass officials and be like, hey, I saw you're like doing this. Why don't you pay attention to this also very large issue? Um, Cause we also deal with a problem where officials just don't want to talk to us. They'll ignore us. Um, so we, we had like a counter, like a count up, like we were trying to get our um, town supervisor, Ed Romaine to come meet with us for a very long time. And um, we've, we've been looking for him. We have a little, where is Ed Romaine? We don't know. Um, we've hosted action hours to send out emails and calls to our representatives. Um, we've mobilized community members to go to town halls. We had um, a rezoning town hall in the summer that the community was given about three days notice for. Um, and there were no like notices that actually went out to the people who live next to this parcel of land that was being rezoned that could potentially affect like the future of the landfill. Um, so we actually had members go and knock on people's doors and say, hey, this is happening. Um, you, we need to show up and do something about it because the town is not going to let us know. They're just gonna do it without us. Um, so we have been mobilizing in that way. We've had sign on letters and petitions. We've uh, done several news, uh, news interviews and articles. Uh, we've had articles in the paper, um, radio interviews. We uh, have made our own lawn signs, which the, um, the town of Brookhaven tried to co-op and um, steal from us, but that's just silly. And um, so we've, we've, we've had lawn signs in both English and Spanish. We have posters in English and Spanish. We've had a postcard campaign with English and Spanish um, to go out to inform the residents of what's going on. Um, and we've connected with organizations uh, like this one to, to really bring our message across to many different platforms and also just connect with others and offer our support to other organizations. Thank you, Aaron. So I'm just gonna get into a bit of the programs that BLARC has been involved in. Um, this past summer, starting on June 4th, we started our composting program and it ended on September 4th and we were successfully able to divert about 1200 pounds of organic waste from incineration and subsequently the Brookhaven landfill. Um, we are currently in our visual waste audit initiative, and this involves us doing a residential waste audit so that we can learn more about waste generation um, in the town of Brookhaven, um, disposal methods, and how we can work towards zero waste and other waste diversion methods. And yeah, just guide the town to more zero waste solutions. We get, as said, to we get told so much that we. Um, want the landfill closed, we don't want any more ash, but we don't come up with any solutions to do that. Well, we're doing that now. And we have amazing outreach. So BLARG is constantly with other groups on Long Island in New York City and in different states because the Long Island's waste crisis isn't just a Long Island waste crisis. Any waste that isn't brought to any of the four incinerators is sent to nearly two dozen landfills in four different states. So we connect with different communities other landfill communities who received Long Island waste and we hear from them and we amplify their stories as well. And we also um, have groups come on our meetings and we learn about waste reduction strategies and resistance strategies as well. And uh, so the way we run our meetings, we have weekly meetings on a Friday and we start with just a re reiteration of what our values are and grounding ourselves in the fact that Black Lives Matter, um, in the fact that we are sitting on native land, um, on Uncle Chug land, 
and that we need to be respectful of the land and the people who live on it. Uh, we rotate the jobs of host, facilitator, and note taker, and we organize ourselves. So, like, if someone wants to say something, they, they type stack in the chat and we like go through. So, it's make sure everyone can have a say in what's going on. Um, we've had a lot of meetings with a lot of very important guests. Uh, we've brought in Winters Brothers, uh, who have tried to propose a waste transfer station in like the same community. Um, we've brought on a committee that was reviewing the town's uh, plan for waste management and ultimately said that we should not have this Asheville expansion plan. Um, we've brought Covanta on and uh, talked to them about their incineration. We've had the DEC on more than once. Uh, we've had present presenters from Fostoria, Ohio, like Gabrielle mentioned, we are connecting with people where our trash ends up going if it's not on Long Island. Uh, we've had uh, assembly members and legislators. And of course we have other organizations as well. So just to highlight some of the challenges that we face as a group is um, a lack of engagement and transparency from the town of Brookhaven and council members. Um, as Erin mentioned before, we um, have yet to see uh, Brookhaven's town supervisor, Ed Romaine, at any of our meetings, um, been to events where he was at and he basically just turns his back right to, to us and leaves. Um, we have difficulty um, getting documentation um, like foils and um, just any information on the landfill. Uh, what are the emissions? How much money is going into it? How much money does the town make? Um, why hasn't um, the leachate been investigated? These are all things that we have to foil for, we have to hound the town for because apparently nobody knows and we have to do all of these things ourselves. Um, it's difficult when we have public hearings that don't have any information about what's going on. As Aaron mentioned before, the last uh, public, the uh, last town hall, there was three days notice of what was going on and we had to activate very quickly and engage the community to resist and to confront the town of Brookhaven about rezoning. And that we're, the public is constantly asked to comment on things that we're not told about. Um, just like the Medford transfer station, landfill rezoning, and um, sale. And also we face community fatigue, um, as is the case with like a lot of frontline groups. So we um, mitigate that by having um, the last Friday for each month off. Um, we usually have weekly BLARC meetings. So we give folks a chance to rest and we offer, offer many ways for folks to be involved. Um, for example, if they can't be involved in a waste audit. Well, there's plenty of opportunities to be involved in social media, um, letter writing, and in outreach. And that brings us to the end. Closed means closed. And um, please connect with us on Facebook and Instagram and spread the word in your communities and networks. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, that was really informative and it was great getting to hear like all of these different tools and strategies you're using um, to mobilize your community and get decision makers to the table. Um, oops, sorry, I just realized I wasn't on camera. Um, so I'm not seeing very many questions specific to um, Blarg in particular, though there's a lot of great questions in there. So I think we can just ask them of all the panelists, um, just so we can get um, everyone's perspectives. Are y'all cool with that? Awesome. Well, Byron Chan just asked, how do you address the potential loss of jobs, especially union jobs, as you advocate for the shutdown of landfills or incinerators? Um, since most zero waste economy jobs like repairing, recycling and composting are not yet unionized. Yeah, thanks for asking this. And um, I think there is a love hate relationship with that question. Um, perhaps folks from Blar can speak more, more eloquently on this. Um, but to, as I understand it, um, in regard to the landfill, when it comes to the communities, many community members didn't have a choice about their job placement and working at the landfill. I know there's someone on the call here today who worked at the Brookhaven landfill and can no, now no longer work. And what that says to us is that 
these companies, these waste management jobs don't care about their employees. They don't care about safety. And there was a whistleblower um, report just recently that came out that was settled by the town of Brookhaven because they didn't want to do discovery. So the difference with that is that when you have zero waste solution jobs, they're safe. They're not going to cause you cancer. They're not going to be dangerous for you. And they're within the community and they have the community in mind and they have community engagement. And we would want to have jobs for any workers who want to get out of, or if we succeed in closing the Brookhaven landfill, we would want to have zero waste jobs available to them. We would want to have rights repair shops. We would want to have more recycling. We would want to have things like that. So we just need to work on that. And if I can just add to that, I think one of the things we, we use was like, a lot of people thought when we were when we we're trying to get the incinerator shut down that it's a war on jobs, and we're like, it's there should never be a decision made between a job and people's health, right? It should never be an if or thing. It should be they should be able to have a job and still have their health, and the community's health should not be put at stake for them to have a job. And so, we have to like what you said. It's just really building out those systems that they have a way to transfer into different systems because zero waste systems actually create more jobs. Like at the incinerator here, it's only sixty five jobs. Like it's not many and zero waste would like triple that. Like it, it, it makes no sense that we actually are not making more jobs for more families um, to be able to like have a sustainable living. Uh, and so I think that it's in any, like honestly, anything could be unionized. I really think it's about like once those people get in those fields, if you wanna create those unions, do it. I think that some of what we are putting forward with creating the compost facility is that we want them to be union jobs. So that's something that we wanna be write, written into the contract. Um, that we are contracted with these operators and local. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a, just a lot of uh, basis that you can do it. Yeah. Now, to add to that, um, sorry, Addy. Go for it. No, um, go on Long Island, we have um, recently proposals to have um, abandoned wastelands or orphaned um, sites that are underdeveloped and that they don't have anything going on and that the community can use them to have community gardens, community composting. How wonderful would it be if folks were reimbursed for that? How wonderful would it be if those were jobs? How many jobs would that create? How many orphan lots are there on Long Island that could support communities? And that's all I uh, Now you guys got me riled up. <laughs> I think those are really good answers. And also just as a reference, um, we do have um, a section on how to support transitional workers. Um, in the zero waste master plan, it's towards the end. Um, so lots of different ways from in placing uh, priority hiring for transitioning workers, um, ensuring a wage guarantee, having a workforce transition plan. Obviously, there are many things that depend um, on action at a federal level and things like that. But there are some things um, that folks can work towards. Um, and we had uh, input from unions that uh, members work with on that section. So something you might want to check out, I'll include a link in the follow up. Um, so we have a couple more minutes. Um, I think another question that folks would answer is, how do you as organizers deal with any intimidation or undermining tactics from those companies? Um, and if that's not something you've dealt with, like also how do you deal with intimidation and opposition and co-opting? Um, yeah, by, by both companies and um, government officials who may be seeking to um, control or water down um, a campaign. I know that's kind of broad, but I, a couple of people have asked questions in that vein. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, as far as I know, Blark hasn't been intimidated. It's actually quite the opposite. The town and the companies are intimidated by us and they don't like talking to us. <laughs> so um, I may be wrong. Uh, someone's from Blark is in the chat. That hasn't been my experience. In my experience, um, towns and other groups who support the town are intimidated by us and um, don't want to engage. Yeah, I think we get that with this innovator work, but we also get like like, I, I think it's really important to remember, like, 
the incinerator is a company and they're going to fight for like to be doing exactly what they're doing. They're going to fight to create profit, to like keep making their profit. And so what they did was really try to divide community activists that was in our community. And it was like payouts. So they were trying to like pay people in our communities to like say like incinerator isn't that bad or they're trying to give foods to people in the community and they're like what and they came up into schools like they came into schools they were acting like they're great neighbors and so it's like that's their I think that's more of their intimidating like um that they're trying to do and we make sure to still call them out for that um I wish they would talk more they do not talk to us anymore they just won't engage but um yeah, so it's just a lot of buyouts that they try to do that you just got to successfully shut down and remind people of like, you know, we can't sell out, we can't sell out our communities, we just can't do that. Yeah, and things I've heard from other organizers in our network is that looking to examples of similar facilities or the same company um, in other places and seeing what the impacts have been in those places. Um, so I think that that's maybe uh, another tool. Um, time for, I guess, one last question. Um, and this one's coming from me um, as a moderator. Um, although, uh, you know, we, we can still have open channels for communication beyond this. Uh, so lastly, how can environmental and other organizations that might have more access to resources that support environmental justice and other grassroots groups um, campaigning for zero waste communities? I can start. <laughs> Um, I think it's exactly what like what Gaia does, like with the cohort, with the fill incinerator cohort. It's put us in contact with other people that's doing the same fight, like that's literally doing the same thing that we're doing that we can learn from. Um, it's more than just like, you know, than the funding or money. It's like giving like experiences and tactics and things like that that's happening in other communities to be able to try in your own communities um, and being able to have a space to share that and talk about sometimes that it gets hard. Um, and we need a space as organizers to come together to be able to say, okay, let's reevaluate this. <laughs> what did you guys do? Can we see your fact sheet? What does it look like? Um, you know, and so I think like just having that space to actually have conversations with other groups that you're like that's involved is also good. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, just knowing that um, as BLARG, we're not alone. Um, there are a lot of groups out there who are fighting for the same thing for waste reduction for zero waste and we can connect with so many um, we have the luxury of it in New York um, to be connected with so many groups and like BK Rot um, who does amazing work in Brooklyn and also connecting with um, other landfill groups and see how they're doing what they're doing to um, resist their situation their landfilling situation and also um, learning from the mistakes of other folks who have had their fights. Yeah, and I would also just add, um, I think it kind of harps back to the previous question as well, like always um, reaching back to the community um, and making sure that we're supporting the voices that are in the community. And just be just because like we're working on a landfill doesn't mean like we can also work on like housing and, and support other initiatives that are just like very uh, closely paralleled with, um, with this issue. And and then by showing the community that we are we are working on a we we care in a variety of ways, that's also holding off against like Covanta coming in and being like, yeah, we're fine, we're cool, we're gonna give you this like free lunch, and then that's that's it. Like that. So being there for your community is also and and having making sure that like aid from above does not like get in the way of what the community actually needs is important. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. These things that you mentioned around, uh, you know, movement building and ensuring that, um, you know, people are also, you know, being consulted in these processes, uh, making sure that there is knowledge, knowledge exchange and a flow of resources. That's also important. And I'm so excited that we all, um, you know, seem to be moving towards um, translocal work. So hyper-local organizing, but we're connecting to folks in other places. And that's really what this whole, um, our network and also this uh, digital event series is all about. 
So we have three more webinars coming up after this. Um, but first of all, before I say more, I wanna thank everybody who helped put together this webinar on the Gaia team, as well as Gabrielle, Aaron, and Shashanda, and um, the other folks at Blarg and SBCLT who are doing all of this incredible, inspiring organizing work and are willing to share um, their knowledge with us. So thank you, ladies. Um, also, I'd like to note that all, I believe um, we have a full lineup of women and non-binary speakers on this um, series, which is really exciting to me personally as a woman of color. Um, so the next session that we are hosting is going to be um, in a, about a little over a week. Um, it will be on working with legislators. After that, we have a really exciting session on uh, how to tell your story, both converting your campaign into a compelling narrative, but also tailoring it and developing skills to engage media. And then lastly, a session on creating systems level organics policy. Um, and I did see some questions about anaerobic digestion in the chat. So that will be you know, a place where we talk about that whole realm of organics management work, including AD. And um, just a heads up for everyone here, we're also launching a composting working group for Gaia members and folks who might be interested in becoming members where we can also take a deeper dive into those kinds of things. So to stay tuned. Um, I'll be sending out a follow-up email, so be sure to check that out. It'll have all these links, parts of the chat, um, and ways to continue being involved. So thank you for joining everyone. I will drop the registration link in the chat one more time before um, people head off. But yeah, thank you and enjoy the rest of your afternoons. Thank you for hosting. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Adi.